Welcome, welcome wherever you are, anywhere in the world. Welcome to Life Church Panania's Church at Your Place. We are your hosts. I am Ian. And I'm Eleanor. And it's a delight to be with you, bringing you our church service today. It doesn't stop here. We are going to go deeper. And have you printed out your Go Deeper sheets ready to roll? And one other thing before we start. A big thank you to all our worker bees who so diligently prepared our church for our physical return. Our theme for today is Finishing Strong. We're going to be connecting with someone who's in the second half of life and doesn't want to end life with a whimper but finish strong. And who doesn't want that? That's how we're going to finish. But we always start with prayer. Father, we bow before you. We are so inadequate and so limited, yet you are beyond anything that we know. You have foreknowledge of everything. You are all-powerful. So enable us to connect with you that we might live out our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin a new series uh, today. It comes from the little book of 1 Peter. Hear the word of the Lord. From Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elected sojourners scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling by the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you, and peace in abundance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In setting the theme of finishing strong, we've got our finish line firmly in our sights. Our first song is, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop and it's not that very far away. Let's sing it together.
great singing. Now, let's come and spend just a little time in prayer. Our, our thoughts for prayer today are this. Begin the day seeking him. Through the day, follow him. End the day thanking him. Let's use those thoughts to spend a moment with him now. Father, the day has begun and you're already moving in our lives. There are things that you're trying to say to us, things that you're trying to do in us. Oh, that we would pause and look and listen and find you so that throughout the day we would not lose sight of you but follow you ever more closely. Help us to take our eyes off the things of this world, the things of people, the things of objects, the things of tasks, the things of the world, so that we might be entirely focused on you and follow you, so that when we get to the end of this day, we can look back and see you have been in it with us. You have helped us through it. You have been part of everything that's happened our successes, our not-so-successful times. But you were in those for us. And then we get to the end of our last day. We can look back over our life, thanking you for salvation, looking forward in anticipation to that mansion that's only just over the hilltop, and we would step from this life into the next, full of rejoicing. And so we... Seek Jesus first. Amen. Thank you for those who are supporting our church and our ministries. If you'd like to do that at your bank, you can do it with these numbers. You can do it online with these numbers. And you can give directly to Mission, uh, our mission in Myanmar to the orphanage and the Bible school through these numbers. Thank you for your generosity. God is very much at work with our people. And speaking of who we are and of the little book of 1 Peter, our next song is taken directly from the words of Scripture. For we're reminded that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that we may declare the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Okay, let's sing this together. That was great. And now we're going to think about these opening verses from 1 Peter about finishing strong. And what we want to note through the, this whole message is the rest of my life is going to be great. Everything that God is doing in my life will help me. Think, not everything is going to be great, 
but the end result is going to be great. And here's how we know this is true, because we can unpack this passage and know that the rest of my life is going to be great because of who I am. That's the first thing you can jot down. Life is great because of who I am. Now, you might look at yourself and think, oh, but you don't know me. I am so ordinary. There's nothing very special about me. But I'm right and you're wrong. You are interesting. You are talented. You are skillful. You are resourceful. You are capable. You are resilient. And most important of all, you are loved by God himself. Nothing matters more than that because out of that, everything else flows. So what can we learn from these opening verses from Peter's gospel, or Peter's letter, rather? First of all, I am an ordinary person. Now, Peter was pretty ordinary. He was just an average sort of guy with an average sort of job, living an average sort of life. He was very ordinary. But that's not a problem. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose things of the... Sorry, let me start that bit again. But God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. So the good news is God must love ordinary people like you and me. After all, he made so many of us. And these are the people he can work best with. There's something else that lifts me above ordinary, and that is I have heavenly gifts. It's only ordinary people that God can use. Everyone else is full of themselves, but those who are not full of themselves can receive heavenly gifts. And Peter identifies his gift. The gift that he received was he was an apostle. Now, every believer has a spiritual gift. Who knows, you you may even have several spiritual gifts. I suspect you probably do, more than probably do. And we know that because we read 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Each and every single one of you has your own gift from God. One is this gift, one is that gift. And we all have gifts, every single one of us, or this. To each of you, the manifestation of the Spirit has given for the common good. This tells us not only that you've got a gift or gifts, but why you've got the gift. Or this verse, He distributes them to each of you just as He determines. Oh, you know what one of my biggest bugbears is? It's people who go clamoring after the, the flashy gifts. Oh, I want to be a prophet. Oh, I want the gift of tongues. Why doesn't anybody want the gift of mercy? Why doesn't anyone want the gift of generosity? But no, here's what Scripture says. God himself distributes them to each of you just as he determines. He's gifted you so that you can live the life that he's got planned out for you. So here's the balance of that. The second point is, no one has all the gifts. No one's got all the gifts. Uh, Not everyone's an apostle. Not everyone's a prophet. Not everyone can work miracles. Not everyone can heal the sick. Not everyone can speak in tongues. We've all got our own unique gift. Let's celebrate the differences we all have. So here's something else we could note. Every believer should use their spiritual gift. So here we are in the first letter from Peter, and he says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. And here is it again, the the reason why we're gifted, to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So the gifts that you have are an expression of the grace of God. But what if you're thinking, oh, but I don't know my spiritual gifts. I've got no idea how God has gifted me. Well, 
the shape that you're in will give you some clue as to what your gift is. First of all, the shape, the S is for service. How you serve is the way in which you're already using the gift that God has given you. The H is for heart. What is it that you love doing? What is it that you want to do? If you had a choice, how would you serve? That's your heart. That tells you what your spiritual gift is. And your abilities. You've learned many skills. You've got natural talents. And how you are putting everything together at work. Your abilities are your gift at work. And P, your personality. That's an a indicator of the sort of gift you've got. God's not out to make you miserable. What he wants to do is gift you so that you can be the best that you possibly are. And then the E is the experiences that you have. They are preparing you to use your gift. The, the terrible things that have happened to you. That's an opportunity for your gift to be at work. The great things that you've done. That's a positive experience. That again is an opportunity for you to prepare to use your gift in yet another setting. Here's something for Steve and Tony. I'm not sure if um, lycra is a spiritual gift, but bikes aren't meant to be ridden on the beach and certainly not to be taken into the surf. That's how it is with gifts. God wants you to use what you've got where you are for the benefit of others. This doesn't look like it's benefiting anyone. Moving on, we can see that I have earthly limits. I'm very limited. And so as we move into the next line that Peter writes, to the elected sojourners, those who are scattered. Sojourners is related to the word journey. We're people on a journey. We're, we're on our way through this life to somewhere better. And we're few in number. We're scattered far and wide. There are limits to what I can do in this world. Now, look at this swimmer stretching out, reaching for the finish line. But look at his legs. That's right. He doesn't have any. He's got earthly limits but it hasn't stopped him striving to be everything that God has equipped him to be and to do that's us we've got limits but we strive ahead anyway the second thing that we're going to note is this the rest of my life is going to be great because of whose I am not just who I am but whose I am I am bought with a price and belong to God himself. And there are things that we can note as we unpack this in verse 2. I am the right person to live this life. God has foreknowledge. He saw what was coming. He knew what was ahead of me. And so he's prepared me to live out this life. I can't live your life, nor you live mine. But God sees what's coming. And of, of course, we all want to know what's coming so that we can prepare for it or we can avoid it. We are looking to see what God knows. He's preparing us for life. Let me give you an example. Here's a train. A train is always predestined meaning it has a predetermined destination. That's rather like your life and God's foreknowledge because those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be, to be, to be what? Go on, have a guess. Predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his son. This is what God has seen in you. This is what he expects of you. This is where he's taking you to be, to be like Jesus. And when we fall over, we need to get up and dust ourselves off and keep moving forward to this destination, Christ-likeness. And to achieve that, the next thing we note is, I am equipped to live a holy life. And so here we have the sanctification of the Spirit. 
Sanctification is the word that gives us saints, and saints are holy people. So sanctification means equipped for a holy life. Those of you who are regular with Life Church Panania would know the, the three things that are God's will for your life. And here's the second one. It is God's will that you should be holy. And then he gives some examples of things that you should do, shouldn't do, that are obvious things about helping you towards holiness. Not a comprehensive list, but a, a representative list. And then he ends this little paragraph by saying, God's called us to holiness, just in case you missed it at the opening line of the paragraph. That's what God wants for us. Now, Jesus is the holiest person who ever lived and I'm to be conformed to him. I'm to live a holy life. And I'm equipped for that because this sanctification that the Holy Spirit is working in my life or trying to work when I listen is for what purpose? It's for obedience. And so we, we read... God is energizing you to give you the desire and the energy to do what pleases him. So if you think on a Sunday morning, oh, I'm a bit tired. Oh, I've got so much to do. Oh, I really don't feel like it. You're quenching the Spirit. That's not what God is doing for you. What He is actually doing in you is speaking against the flesh and saying He's energizing you, giving you the desire and the energy so that you can be all that He saved you and called you to be, which is like Jesus. And that's why I am saved to live a redeemed life. And so the third person of the Trinity comes out here and it's the sprinkling by the blood of Jesus. It's his shed blood that saved us from sin and we should ever live at the foot of the cross so that we never forget what he's done for us and we are constantly sprinkled by the blood of Jesus to free us from our sin, to free us from ourselves, to free us to live the life that he has got for us so that we might live out the redeemed life with which we are already equipped. And so we read, Dear friends, as you have always obeyed, here it is again, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There are so many ways your life could go. Choose the one that takes you to holiness, to the life of Christ-likeness. And then there's one more thing at the end of this verse, and that is the rest of my life is going to be great because of all I have. And I've got more than all I need. Look at how the verse wraps up. First of all, I have God's grace to me. It says grace to you. Why is grace so important? You remember Paul complaining about his thorn in the flesh? Oh, I don't like this. Oh, life is hard. Oh, life is terrible. Life's not going the way I want. These thorns are annoying. And so God responded to him and said, My grace is sufficient for you because my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, the apostle says, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. That's so important. Let, let's just stay here for a moment and unpack that. Notice the contrast. God says, my power. It's the power of Christ. Whereas all we have is weakness. My weakness. The, the contrast needs to be obvious. Otherwise, we'll try and do things in our own strength. The next thing to notice is the action and the outcome. I will, and here's action on my part, so that, so here is the result that will come when I put into practice what I'm supposed to be practicing. 
So what is it that I'm to do? I will boast all the more gladly. There's no to-do list here. There's, there's no action to be performed. It's all about attitude. I will boast all the more gladly. It's boasting. It's, a, it's about the attitude of gladness. Where is the gladness in your life? Are you boasting about, I am so pleased. I am so grateful. I am so thankful. It changes your whole outlook on life. But glad about what? Not glad that I am weak. Not boasting about how tough life is for me. It's not about saying, oh, I'm so poor, I'm so destitute, I'm so broken, I'm so under the what are circumstances. No, it's I will boast in my weaknesses, not boast of my weaknesses, but boast within this state of weakness. I'm glad that I don't have the resources because my life of faith allows me to reach up and lay hold of Christ, who is my strength. And when I do that, I boast more gladly within my weaknesses. And the outcome is the power of Christ rests on me, not in me. It doesn't make me powerful. I'm still in my weakness. But the power of Christ is transforming me in spite of my weakness. Not only do we have God's grace, as fabulous as that is, we also have God's peace in me. Grace to you and peace. Now, peace now wells up within. In spite of the circumstances around, I can still have peace rising up, bubbling up, welling up within me so that the power of Christ surrounds me, is on me, use those terms, and it's all because the grace of God is for me. And then it wraps up with this. I have God's abundance through me. Grace and peace, how much? Not a piddling little amount that I have to scrounge to get, but I have God's abundance. Everything that I need, more than everything I need, is right here with me, in me, through me, right here and now. That's why the rest of my life is going to be so great. He provides for the birds and the insects. Doesn't he provide everything that we need and so much more? So the rest of my life is going to be great. It won't be earth shattering, but it will be filled with a usefulness because of my gifts and my gra uh, the grace of God in me, peace welling up through me so that I have everything I need in abundance. Let me pray. Father, you know only too well, life sometimes sucks. We don't enjoy perfect health or perfect circumstances or even a perfect personality. But it's in this weakness that you can show your power so that it's no longer about my flesh, but rather about your grace, which is indeed sufficient for everything I face. So thank you for your foreknowledge and your equipping so that the rest of my life can indeed be great. And we thank you for that through Jesus' work. Amen. Uh, there's some questions for you for discussion over lunch and I hope that when we all finally get back together you'll be able to join us. Now here is our final song that we can sing out. We're living for the kingdom. That's because we're living for the king.
Great. The rest of my life is going to be great. The Lord bless you and keep you with his grace, in his peace, with abundance today and forever and ever. Amen. Now, let's have a nice cup of tea, shall we? God bless.